baptizo, baptizo to sink a ship. Outside of divine revelation, obviously, the word baptize was also used for religious washings among ancient Greeks. And even in the Greek mystery religions, they would even identify new converts into the religion through baptism. From what I understand in Judaism, if you wanted to get into Judaism, you'd be baptized. If you wanted out, you had to get baptized out. So again, the idea, uh, the nuance is, is identification when you study baptism in its, in its different context. Uh, Dr. Ryrie, if, as many of you, you know and study, he said this about baptism. He said, theologically, baptism may be defined as an act of, of association or identification with someone some group, some message, or some event. Christian baptism means identification with the message of the gospel, the person of the Savior, and the group of believers. Now, briefly, we'll talk a little bit about this. A lot of Christians don't know this, but when you open the Bible and look up the word baptism or baptize, baptizo, and see that word, there are at least eight baptisms in the Bible, and they're not all identical. But I think you can argue for one uh, common denominator, which would be identification. Let's look at a few of these, and we could spend a few sermons on each one. Some of these we have looked at. But there was, number one, the baptism of the nation Israel by John the Baptist. This was not for conversion. In other words, that the ritual would give them salvation. This is seen in Matthew 3, 1 through 11, and the parallel passage in, in Luke chapter 3. So through John's water baptism... The nation Israel would be identified with the one John pointed to, which would namely be Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, and the king. So this is similar to Peter's baptism in Acts 2.38, when now, uh, uh, after giving the message, the, the Jews in that chapter, 3,000 come to faith, and then they're subsequently baptized. The second one on the list is the baptism of Jesus. If baptism means salvation, you have a problem with this one, right? because Jesus didn't need salvation. So if you look at the baptism of Jesus, you'll see this revealed in Matthew 3, 13 through 17. So John the Baptist would have Jesus come up to him, and Jesus would have John baptize Jesus. So in the Old Testament, a prophet would anoint the king, right? Uh, well, now, like Samuel did this with Saul. Uh, so there's an anointing of the king. What does the Holy Spirit come down on Jesus? It's anointing him for service. So uh, John the Baptist is this prophet. He's not doing the actual anointing, but he is present at the baptism of Jesus as the Holy Spirit descends on him, therefore Jesus being identified with his mission on earth for which the Father sent him. So Jesus was baptized for several reasons. To Number one, to fulfill all righteousness, which would be the righteousness of the law. Um, he would fulfill the demands of the law. This was said uh, to John the Baptist by Jesus himself in Matthew 3. He would be identified with the preaching of the kingdom. Again, he would be identified as the ultimate representative of the believing remnant of Israel prepared by John. He would also be identified with sinners. He would be identified by being made known publicly to the nation Israel. And he would also receive his special anointing by the Spirit as the Spirit would come down from heaven and descend on him like a dove. So God the Father would even identify Christ as the long-awaited Messiah. What did he say from heaven? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And that, I think, is a, is a reference to the Davidic sonship. They were waiting for the ultimate son of David in the line of Judah, all the way from the Davidic covenant, and Jesus is that one. And the father gives verbal testimony that Jesus was the promised king. Then you have number three, the baptism of the Holy Spirit from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. I will get to that one uh, here in a moment. Then you have the baptism of Noah, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. And then a unique one, the baptism of Moses, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 2. And a lot of Christians go, there's a baptism of Moses? Well, in 1 Corinthians 10, 2, it reveals that all the, uh, all the Jews that went through the Red Sea were baptized into Moses. Well, there were, the, who got wet? The Egyptians, the enemy got wet. They were drowned. But the Jews went through on dry land across the sea to their rescue. So again, to be identified with Moses is the idea. To be baptized into Moses would, would be to be identified with their leader who led them across the Red Sea under God's authority. And then you had the baptism of fire, number six, Matthew 3, 13 through 17. 
Number seven, the baptism of the cross, Mark 10, 38 and 39. And basically this teaches that Jesus would receive an identification on the cross, namely he would be identified with sinners by receiving their sins in his own body on the cross. So there's no water with that one. Many of these are just dry baptisms, but they are all some sort of identification. And then number eight, we have the believer's baptism for the church age, Acts 8, 36 through 38, and many other passages, a few we will, we will look at. Now, did Jesus actually baptize? He was baptized, but he didn't actually baptize, but he approved. Uh, John 4, 1 through 3 would reveal this. He approved of his disciples baptizing. John 4, 1 says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, the text says in kind of a, par uh, a little side here, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. Uh, in the Great Commission, Jesus would command baptism. John, uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came up and spoke to them, meaning the disciples. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And I would add in the Greek, um, the main verb is make disciples. How do you do that? The Greek participles would say, by baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So you, uh, the main idea is to make disciples. You do this by baptizing them. And I'm in agreement with those who believe the baptizing them would have included giving the message of the gospel and the subsequent water baptism, because usually people were baptized immediately after faith. And you can see that pattern uh, in, 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 the, in the book of Acts. So again, you say, well, the gospel's not mentioned there. I think that would be assumed that they would have given the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ, and then the disciples would be made by baptizing them and then teaching them the word of God. The early church placed a very strong emphasis on baptism. For example, Acts 2, when Peter gives his sermon at Pentecost in verse 41, it says, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Now that's, how many candidates do we have? Less than 10. What if 3,000 were lined up? How much room would we need? This church holds a little, what, 300 maybe? And... Uh, I think we'd have some people in the parking lot waiting. So the question is, have you ever wondered, where would Peter have had that much water in the temple area? How much water is right around that area? There's not like big lakes and stuff around that area. So where would Peter have access to water to baptize that many people? This is an interesting picture, a modern picture, of something that's been around a long time. It's called a mikveh, and a mikveh, it comes, I think, from the Hebrew word in Genesis 1. Remember, God collected and gathered the waters? Uh, you, put, you put the muf prefix to it, and it refers to, uh, it's a water pool. And uh, so the mikveh is a, was a ritual bath for purification. And a pastor friend of mine who's been over to Israel many times, he, he said in the southern area of the Temple Mount, he counted 35 of these alone. So he said there's plenty of those. And look how many steps you'd have to go down. So there were plenty of places to perform the baptism um, uh, back then. For those people who say, well, the Bible isn't real, they couldn't have baptized that many. Well, if you just go over there, you could see where that would have, would have been easily true. Now, other places all through Acts where you see uh, baptism being uh, focused on in the early church, you have Acts 12 and 13. Uh, when, they believe Philip, uh, when they believe Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip as he observed uh, signs and great miracles taking place, and he was constantly amazed. Let me give you some other scriptures in the early church about baptism, Acts 8, 36 and 38. This is Philip baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch. And this man is reading from Isaiah 53 and uh, was asked, you know, who is this? And he said, well, I need someone to explain this text to me. And Philip explains that it was a reference to Jesus Christ in prophecy. And so as they went along, uh, he puts his faith in Christ. They went along and they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? So immediately this occurred. 
and he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he, he baptized him. Many, many other places we won't read in detail, but you have Acts 9.18, you have the baptism of the Apostle Paul, Acts 10.47 and 48, the baptism of Gentiles, Acts 16.15, uh, Lydia, she was baptized. Acts 16.33, the same chapter, has the baptism of the Philippian jailer. We said, what must I do to be saved? And they say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Then afterwards, see it's a post-salvation ritual for the church. Afterwards, he was baptized and also his, his family, Acts 16.33. Acts 18.8, the baptism of the Corinthians. Um, and Acts 19.5, yeah, the baptism of the disciples at, at Ephesus. Now let's get to that other scripture I mentioned, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If some of you want to open to 1 Corinthians 12, um, please, please do that. We're going to go to one central text. Again, this is another baptism or identification which required no water. All it required was faith alone in Christ alone, the one who died on the cross for our sins. Now, the baptism of the Spirit is, a, is an important event. I think it occurs at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, and it's also something God is using to form the body of Christ. Remember, the body of Christ has Jew and Gentile in one body. So the church age begins on the day of Pentecost, when God sends the Holy Spirit. This is all recorded in Acts 2. The church age will end with what's called the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And that's when the Lord comes back to receive the church, uh, even those who have physically died and those who are alive when the rapture occurs, the resurrection will uh, occur simultaneously. And then until the rapture, God is gathering Jew and Gentile into one new body called the church. And you can see this in Ephesians 2, 11 through 3, 13. And this is all being accomplished by a unique ministry during the church age called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So if you're looking at 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13, obviously there's a spirit baptism by the words here. Even, he says, for even as the body, in verse 12, for even as the body is one, yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though are many, are one body, so also is Christ. So what he does is he takes the human body as an illustration, and a body has many parts. He says, likewise, Christ's body, remember Christ is the head of the church, and we are all body parts in the body with all spiritual, different spiritual gifts. And he says, verse 13, for, I would translate this, for by means of one spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, we, all believers, we were, past tense, we were all baptized into one body. That's the body of Christ. Does, now, does your race make a difference? Your economic status? No. It says, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, other passages even include male and female, uh, Galatians 3, 26 through 28. Whether slave or free, Jew or Greek, all were made to drink of one spirit. So clearly there's a baptism by means of the Holy Spirit. So I think Jesus is the baptizer. He takes us at the moment of faith and by means of the Holy Spirit identifies us in the body of Christ spiritually. And so now at that very moment, we're all in Christ Jesus. Go with me to Romans 6. If you want to please turn there. And if you're on the front row, you got the board. Romans 6 is a debated passage on whether this is um, spirit baptism or water baptism. I hold the view of spirit baptism, even though the word spirit isn't mentioned directly. I would put it in parallel with the 1 Corinthians passage. And I think it was Charles who mentioned something about continuing to demonstrate our identification with Christ in our walk. Very good, because this is, would be this passage. Romans 6, and definitely beyond the fifth verse. That's all I have up there. What did Paul says in 6.1, Therefore, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin so that the grace of God might increase? 
evidently some in that, um, in that time believed that if you, the more you sin, the more God's grace would increase. And you, I agree, you cannot out the grace of God. But it would be nonsense to say since uh, God's grace increases through sin, let's sin all the more. Well, that would be silly. So he says, absolutely not. Uh, we who have, noticed, we who have died to sin, how shall we still live in it? In other words, we all share in Christ's death positionally, so it wouldn't it be uh, incompatible to still live according to the flesh? Or are, you, or are you ignorant that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Again, I think it's, it's a moment of faith where we're baptized by the Spirit into Christ's death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, and the Greek indicates him we have, then certainly we will be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. What did he just promise you? If you're, if you're a Christian and you believed in Christ, you are now, you share in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So you will come to resurrection glory. That's the promise. But in the meantime, he wants, to, wants us to walk, according to verse 4, in the newness of that resurrected life now. So at the moment of faith in Christ, all believers are identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. This is spiritual. All this through the baptism of the Spirit. So Christ died on the cross. He was buried. He was resurrected. And now he lives in the newness of resurrected life. Right? Is he alive now? See, we don't worship somebody in a tomb. We worship a living, living uh, Savior who came out of the tomb and now lives to God at his right hand. So therefore, we can walk in the newness of life under Jesus Christ. So as believers who've been spiritually baptized by means of the Spirit into the body of Christ, which water baptism symbolizes, we now have the privilege and responsibility to walk in that newness of life. I think it's already been made clear in the opening scripture reading and comment that water baptism is not a means of salvation. And I was telling Charles up here before the service, um, when you go into the jail ministries to preach, you can see sometimes 40, 50 men a week, new men. And when you put questions out, how do you get saved, it almost never fails. Somebody says church attendance, uh, stop sinning, um, or be water baptized. Water baptism comes up as the main one. And uh, we've got some work in a group like that when I hear that. Uh, baptism is great, uh, but it doesn't save a person from the uh, eternal condemnation of God. So let's talk about that a little bit just to make sure. Uh, we know every baptismal candidate has made this uh, known to us that salvation is through faith in Christ and not of works. But I think we can uh, do well to hear these scriptures and, and reflect on it, especially if you've already been baptized, because um, sometimes people will try to make you think that your baptism that you believe was uh, not for salvation, they'll try to convince you that it was. So I can't emphasize enough that water baptism or any ritual is not a means of salvation. It's not a ritual that will deliver you from the penalty of sin or the condemnation of God. Salvation is through faith alone and Christ alone and not through the works of the law or works of any kind. So it comes through uh, faith in Christ and the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for us at the cross. So what did Jesus accomplish at the cross? And you know, the more I hear um, gospel presentations, uh, movies, Christian movies, something that's often very uh, silent is the cross of Jesus. You'll hear invite him into your heart. You'll hear these things, but you don't hear much about the substitutionary death on the cross. And that's what paid for our sins. So what did Jesus do on the cross? This has nothing to, this, these two verses don't tell you anything about your requirement. It tells you what he did. So what did Jesus do? Well, God demonstrates his own love toward us. That's God the Father. How did he demonstrate that love? And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died as a substitute for us. So God would send his own son to bear our sins on the cross, which 1 Peter 2.24 says, he himself, that's her reference to Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the cross. There's a substitution. 
We all deserve death. We deserve the lake of fire. We deserve eternal punishment. So somebody took the punishment upon himself so that we could go free if we would believe. So it says, he bore our sins in his own body on the cross so that having died to sin, we might live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed, which is a reference to Isaiah 53. Also, what did Jesus do? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Well, Paul says in Romans 6, when we believe in Jesus, we now share spiritually in that death, burial, and resurrection, which, which baptism symbolizes. And I love this verse Colossians 2, 13 and 14, what did God do with the sin debt of man? Well, he says, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, so in other words, when we were separated from God in spiritual death, he, God the Father, made you, the believer, alive together with him, Jesus, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, what did, and what did God do with the sin debt? Having taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Obviously, Jesus was on that cross, and he, bear, he bore our sins at his own body on that cross. Did he get them all? Did he say, well, I'm not going to die for certain categories. Those are just too offensive. And did he die for all people? I think he did. I think he died for all men and women, Every person that's ever lived, ever been created, from Adam to the last person who will ever walk this earth, and he didn't block out one category of sin. In my opinion, God, I think God believes that all sin is offensive, uh, no matter what it is. So he did complete it. I love John 19:30. Many of the things Jesus said at the end of the, or during his crucifixion, while he's hanging on the cross, very important one. It's written in the Greek as one word, to die. And that Greek perfect tense means it stands finished. It's done. Uh, and Jesus said this after he bore all the sins of the world on the cross. Afterwards, he then dismissed his spirit, committed his spirit into the Father's hands, goes into the grave, and then, of course, would raise from the dead shortly after that. So there's the good news. The bad news is that we're sinners and lost without hope. The good news is that God sent his son who did what we just read. He died as a substitute for our sins on the cross, died for everybody. He died for every sin. So how do we receive salvation? If that's all you need for salvation, then that's universalism, which means all are saved because Jesus died for all. But there's a requirement in the scripture. Acts 16, 31, when the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? The answer was very simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and here he said, you and your household, because he would go share the gospel with his family, and then they would be baptized after salvation with the Philippian jailer. And then, the, have you all ever heard of this verse? For God so loved the world, and I like the translation, for God loved the world in this manner. It can go either way, but the, if you go to the second view, it, what manner did he love us? That he gave his only son. That's... Uh, what shows the love of God more than he would allow the second person of the Trinity, his own son, to become humanity and bear the sins of the sinful creature? And Jesus had no sin. He who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So God loved the world in this manner. That, uh, and I know I'll get uh, attacked for that translation because none of them have it. That, they do. You have to look. But the word can mean in this manner that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God didn't send the son into the world to judge the world, but through the world, that, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe stands judged already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And then Ephesians 2. I'll just give a couple of verses out of the opening scripture reading. Can you be saved through baptism? No. Is baptism valid? Yes. It's not through, through works, though, because baptism would be a work and you can't earn your salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is clear. 
For by grace you have been saved, past tense, through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3.5, he saved us not on the basis of the deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And now a common question that comes up. After you put your faith alone in Christ alone the first time, are you secure? I've probably had more um, debate over this one question than anything I've ever encountered in 23 years of, of being a Christian. And I've been on both sides of the debate. Um, I was on the work side that you could lose your salvation for a short time. Uh, it's interesting. You can believe in Jesus, no works, and then be talked into works. Uh, but I easily saw the flaw of that when someone showed me some other scripture. But I think we're secure. Y'all know I love this verse. Because this shows you that at the moment you believed, you were sealed. No time gap from faith to like 20 years later. The Greek says the, when you believed, you were sealed. So in him, you also, after hearing the message of the truth, that would be the gospel of your salvation. So you've got to hear the message. You can't believe without hearing. Then it says when you believed, you were sealed. Simultaneous action. So the moment you trusted the gospel of Jesus Christ that I just gave you, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, because it's salvation, you now belong to God, you're his possession, to the praise of his glory. So he holds you saved, and the moment you believe, you're sealed. And the Greek word, sphragizo, was a mark to mark with a seal, and was a sign of permanent ownership, authentication, and security in the ancient world. So you are secure because God holds you secure. And even in 430, people say, but what if you sin? Won't that break the seal? 430 would tell us not to sin, but it affirms that it doesn't break the seal. Because he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That's a call to not sin. But does it break the seal? No, because he says, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And the day of redemption is the day of that final deliverance into resurrection glory, where as God's own possession, will we be raised to glory. So you are sealed until the resurrection. He obviously says, but in the meantime, we're supposed to walk a certain way, in the newness of life. Also John 10, 27 and 28, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. Uh, the Greek would then say, And they will in no way ever perish forever. That's how you, I would translate that. And they will, some Bibles just say they will never perish. Uh, it's, it's at least that strong. They will in no way perish forever, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Well, if Jesus is eternal God, he's all-powerful, then you can't be snatched out of God's hand. Water baptism, then, is a ritual to be performed, not for salvation, but because of or after salvation. Water baptism is a post-salvation ordinance for the person who has already put their faith in Christ and is a ritual that publicly demonstrates a believer's spiritual identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection as a member of Christ body. So in summary, there are at least eight different uses of the word baptize in scripture. Each has the idea of identification as its nuance. Number two, water baptism is not a means of salvation. That comes through faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross who bore our sins as our substitute. At the moment of salvation, every believer receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit and is identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and is now capable of walking in the newness of life, and also encouraged. And number four, water baptism is a post-salvation ritual that is the visible testimony that a believer is in union with Christ and identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection.